Well, it's a privilege to be here again. I'm really impressed with what uh, Scott and the other leaders of FAIR have been able to do. For example, uh, to get the previous speaker here, I'm astonished at their influence with the parole board. Uh, <laughs> Brian, uh, Brian told a joke that reminded me of another joke, and probably you've heard this one, uh, about the dyslexic insomniac atheist who stays awake all night wondering if, if there's a dog. Uh, like to, it takes a while, doesn't it? to welcome Claudia Bushman to the ranks of the apologists. Uh, I, uh, Brian raised the question of whether or not apologists uh, ever make mistakes. Uh, I would have disagreed with him until about a week ago when I made my first. Uh, I mistakenly used the obsolete term brontosaurus instead of apatosaurus uh, and was promptly jumped on for it. But I can take it. Um, now, I, I lead off with some jokes because uh, this is going to be an incredibly boring presentation. Uh, there are no jokes in it, no insults. Um, but the question you have to ask yourself as you listen is, is there an acrostic? So <laughs> listen very, very carefully. Um, I'd like to thank Mike Ash for uh, helping me out with the PowerPoint. I wasn't planning to have any, um, but it was decided that I needed it, which is probably true, and so I'm able to look te technically or technologically literate uh, with his help just today. I'm going to read this paper, which I normally don't do, and I apologize for that. Um, I was intimidated, intimidated by the performance earlier today, so I set about it first to memorize it. Uh, and then. I thought that I would try to go one better by giving it, reciting it to you backwards, but I, I think I'll just do it in the orthodox fashion. There's just a lot of stuff here and I want to make sure I didn't leave it out. I feel very strongly about the topic I'm going to be talking about, so uh, please bear with me. I'll try to make it lively. Uh, my wife said, keep me awake, which may suggest an impossible standard, but uh, I will try. Joseph Smith's claims regarding the Book of Mormon seem, uh, at least on the surface, to be very detailed and utterly tangible. They're not mystical claims, but belong to the real world of everyday physical objects. And critics have not been reluctant to meet them head on. As for the golden plates, wrote the evangelical Protestant polemicist G.H. Fraser, we will say simply, there were not any. The gold plates, declared a critic on the fair message board just yesterday, never existed outside Joseph's fertile mind. But the historical evidence suggests, no, it shouts the contrary. A representative statement is that given during an 1878 interview with Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith by David Whitmer, um, which is not here on the screen. It was in June 1829, the latter part of the month. Martin Harris was not with us at this time. He obtained a view of the plates afterwards, the same day. Joseph, Oliver, and myself were together when I saw them. We not only saw the plates of the Book of Mormon, but also the brass plates, the plates of the Book of Ether, the plates containing the record of the wickedness and secret combinations of the people of the world, down to the time of their being engraved, and many other plates. The fact is, it was just as though Joseph, Oliver, and I were sitting just here on a log when we were overshadowed by a light. It was not like the light of the sun or like that of a fire, but more glorious and beautiful. It extended away around us, so I cannot tell how far, but in the midst of this light, about as far off as he sits, pointing to John Whitmer, sitting a few feet from him, uh, there appeared, as it were, a table with many records or plates upon it, besides the plates of the Book of Mormon, also the sword of Laban, the directors, and the interpreters. Lucy Max. Smith, who had seen the chosen witnesses leave for their encounter with the angel in the plates, recalled many years later the scene that ensued at their return. When they returned to the house, it was between 3 and 4 o'clock p.m. Mrs. Whitmer, Mr. Smith, and myself were sitting in a bedroom at the time. On coming in, Joseph threw himself down beside me and exclaimed, Father, Mother, you do not know how happy I am. The Lord has now caused the plates to be shown to three more besides myself. They've seen an angel who has testified to them, and they will have to bear witness to the truth of what I have said, for now they know for themselves that I do not go about to deceive the people, and I feel as if I was relieved of a burden which was almost too heavy for me to bear, and it rejoices my soul that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world. Upon this, Martin Harris came in. He seemed almost overcome with joy, and testified boldly to what he had both seen and heard, and so did David and Oliver, adding that no tongue could express the joy of their hearts and the greatness of the things which they had both seen and heard. 
Ultimately, each of the three witnesses, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer, signed his name to a statement that has appeared in every edition of the Book of Mormon from the beginning. According to David Whitmer, the quite distinct experience of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon, the eight as opposed to the three, occurred one or two days after the experience of the three. Soon thereafter, all of the eight signed their names to a statement that has accompanied the testimony of the three in every printed version of the Book of Mormon. It's worth examining the contrasting character of the experiences reported by the three witnesses and the eight, since I believe their very difference reinforces them. First of all, the experience of the three, as they report it, was suffused with the glory and power of God. In a brilliant light, an angel came down and showed them the plates. They heard the voice of God testifying that the translation had been accomplished by the gift and power of God. Their written testimony is characterized by a marked religious or spiritual tone. It might be termed a supernatural or miraculous testimony. By contrast, the experience of the eight involves no glory, nothing miraculous. It's as mundane as anything can be. No angel shows the plates to them. Joseph Smith does. There's no miraculous light. Unlike the three who seem simply to have observed the plates in the hands of the angel, the eight handled the plates and turned their pages. They hefted them. The language of their official account is cool and even formal or legalistic to the point of emotional distance, the said Smith. God appears in their testimony only as witness to their concluding oath. His voice does not testify to the correctness of the translation. The eight witnesses are manifestly in full possession of their senses and mental faculties. Theirs might be labeled an ordinary or natural testimony. Why the differences? In order, I think, for the task of skeptics to be rendered more difficult. One might be tempted to dismiss the testimony of the three with its spectacular divine accompaniments as hallucinatory, however untenable, untenable that dismissal would be, or mere superstition. By contrast, there is absolutely nothing in the testimony of the eight that points to superstition or hallucination. It is the most matter-of-fact kind of experience, nine men in the woods in the early afternoon, except for the object at the center of it. On the other hand, if one were to approach the witnesses first by way of the eight, and one were inclined to skepticism, one might be tempted to write their experience off as deception by Joseph Smith, or by some other conspirator or group of conspirators. There must really have been plates fabricated to deceive. But this doesn't account for the testimony of the three, which goes beyond fabrication and involves a number of additional objects. In other words, a single explanation seems unable to account for the two very different kinds of experience. This means that the skeptics who wish to explain the two te testimonies away must resort to some unlikely combination of sincere hallucination, already unlikely in and of itself, and deliberate insincere fabrication. Or as we shall see, they must attempt to collapse the difference between the two. Let's examine a case that critics often cite as a parallel to Joseph Smith and his witnesses. Forgery is the virtually certain explanation for the two sets of inscribed metal plates that James Jesse Strang said he had found in Wisconsin and Michigan between 1845 and 1849 and translated. Strang, who claimed to have a letter of appointment from Joseph Smith, announced himself as Joseph Smith's successor and was clearly seeking to imitate the prophet. That his plates really existed is beyond serious dispute. The first set, the three Vori or Raja Manchu plates, were dug up by four witnesses whom Strang had brought in to the, to the appropriate site. Inscribed on both sides with illustrations and writing, the Raja Manchu plates were roughly one and a half by 2.75 inches in size, small enough to fit in the palm of a hand or to carry in a pocket. Among the many who saw them was Stephen Post, who reported that they were brass, and indeed that they resembled the French brass used in familiar kitchen kettles. With all the faith and confidence that I could exercise, he wrote, all that I could realize was that Strang made the plates himself, or at least that it was possible that he made them. One not altogether reliable source reports that, reports that most of the four witnesses to the Raja Manchu plates ultimately repudiated their testimonies. The 18 plates of Laban, likewise of brass, and each about 7 3 8 by 9 inches, were first mentioned in 1849, and in 1851 were seen by seven witnesses. Their testimony appeared at the front of the Book of the Law of the Lord, which Strang said he had translated from the plates of Laban. Work on the translation seems to have begun at least as early as April 1849. An 84-page version appeared in 1851. By 1856, it had reached 350 pages. The statement of Strang's witnesses speaks of seeing the plates. 
but mentions nothing of any miraculous character. Nor did Strang supply any second set of corroborating testimony comparable to that of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. One of the witnesses to the plates of Laban, Samuel Bacon, eventually denied the inspiration of Strang's movement and denounced it as, quote, mere human invention, end quote. Another, Samuel Graham, later claimed that he had assisted Strang in the fabrication of the plates of Laban. The well-read Strang had been an editor 